cord to the cloud. Okay. Um, so without further ado, uh, Monica Blanchard, I will pass the floor to you and I will let you introduce yourself um, right. and kick us off. Awesome. Uh, thanks, Bridget. And I'm going to uh, turn my video off probably just to make sure that I have enough um, bandwidth here, if I can do that. Um, oops, maybe not in my little window. Um, it's okay. Let me know if my, if I start getting choppy and I'll actually figure it out. Um, Cause sometimes okay. my internet's a little unstable as well. So um, hello everyone. My name is Monica Blanchard and I um, am with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and US Fish and Wildlife Service. And thank you so much for having me here tonight to talk about um, the other anadromous fish uh, that is calls our Washington waters home, the Pacific lamprey. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to come um, and talk to you all. And hopefully uh, this will, you know, be a fun discussion. Uh, feel free to, if you've got questions, I don't necessarily, I won't follow the chat, but if, um, Bridget, if you want to monitor that and let me know if there's questions, feel free. Um, it's a nice small group so we can have um, an interactive discussion if you guys want, or we can just talk at the end. So um, tonight I'm going to go over some basic lamprey biology. Um, I spent, I've spent the last decade or so working with salmon and steelhead. Um, and even as a fisheries biologist, I now realize I had really large uh, gaps in my understanding of lamprey biology because they're just such funky fish. And we honestly just have huge gaps in our knowledge as the scientific community about lamprey. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go over some basics and how they differ from our other anadromous fish, um, and then talk about ecosystem connections and how lamprey kind of interplay with our freshwater systems and a little bit of our saltwater systems as well. Um, and then talk about conservation actions and restoration. We're doing so much work in the Northwest, uh, in the name mostly of salmon and steelhead, um, but a lot of that work does benefit lamprey. However, they are different in some ways than salmon. So just kind of talk about what we're doing and how that uh, in, impacts lamprey um, and kind of, kind of the differences between our, our fish. Uh, and then at the end, kind of just touch on the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative um, and the work that we're doing to try to learn more about lamprey in the North Puget Sound and Puget Sound in general. We actually have very limited knowledge um, about lamprey in this area. It's kind of crazy. So some of the work that we've been doing recently um, and work we're going to be continuing on in the future. So I like to start off with some fun fast facts about lamprey and what makes them different than a lot of other fish um, because they are quite unusual. So they do not have jaws to start. So they're a very ancient group of fish that includes lamprey and hagfish as far as living species today um, that are jawless. Uh, they don't have scales. They do not have bones. They have a cartilaginous skeleton. They don't have a swim bladder or paired fins. So just kind of off the bat, they are super different different looking and um, just different than all the other fish we come in contact to as biologists and anglers and ecologists and naturalists in our life. We just, there's nothing like them. They're just so crazy. Um, they have six gill slits, seven gill slits for gas exchange. So they don't have kind of the typical operculum with gills. They just got these little um, pores basically. They have a third eye on the top of their head. So this is a light sensing organ, that kind of light spot on the on that lamprey there. Um, and so actually when they're larval stage, they don't have um, any other eye besides that. So just this kind of light and dark sensing light organ. Um, they have a super good sense of smell. So sort of similar to our salmon and steelhead, but they just have one nostril um, on the center of their face. So again, different looking than our other fish. Um, they're very efficient swimmers, but they are very much the slow and steady model. So they're not very fast, um, but they have this um, kind of snake-like or eel-like motion that actually creates low pressure pockets that pull them through the water. So they're very efficient, but just not as fast. 
and they can't jump, um, but they can climb vertical surfaces. So that um, very uh, charismatic uh, sucker mouth that they have that are mostly the thing that people think of if they think about lamprey um, also allows them to climb vertical surfaces in the case of Pacific lamprey. So it's pretty cool. Hopefully this video will work. Um, this is from a uh, area down in California. So it's actually a pretty large group of Pacific lamprey that are returning. Um, you can see these adults, they're trying to make their way over. Um, this is kind of like a dam that's at a possibly historic bedrock barrier, but um, you can see there's kind of 90 degree angles and um, they're working their way up. So they're actually suctioned on and then they um, kind of release and if you're a climber dyno up, but they just suction their way up the wall. Um, and you can see they're moving over this barrier. There's kind of a, a quite a lot of them here, which is um, kind of unusual these days. So it's a really cool video, um, but yeah, they're just working their way up this, this barrier um, using their mouth. Uh, they are, as I mentioned, extremely old. And I like to show this timeline to give that perspective because just saying old doesn't capture it. Um, so on the right-hand side, we've got us, uh, very, very young. And then 6 million years ago, salmon, where our first re fossil record of salmon appear. Um, the age of the dinosaurs is there in that kind of green gray. And during that time, um, sturgeon uh, evolved. So we got our first fossil record of sturgeon about 200 million years ago. And we always kind of say sturgeon is an old fish but lamprey make them look young. So 450 million year ago, years ago is when we have the first fossil record of lamprey. Um, so to give more perspective, they are actually older than trees. Um, so they are just so old. They're older than Pangea. I mean, they just have been swimming around this earth for so long. Um, and here in the Northwest, we used to get mass of runs um, returning to our waters, much like our salmon and steelhead in the past. Um, so these are photos. The one on the left is from Willamette Falls in the 19 teens. And then the other one is from Kettle Falls um, before it was inundated um, in Eastern Washington. And so there would just be these huge runs of Pacific lamprey returning um, to our waters. Uh, we don't typically see numbers like this anymore. Um, much like our other anadromous fish, they have seen rapid declines in the last um, century. And in this, in the Northwest, um, for many of our tribes, they are extremely culturally significant. Um, and the tribes were really the first people to um, call attention to this other anadromous fish that was seeing major declines. As early as the 70s, um, there were tribes in the Columbia Basin and on the California coast that really started to um, to bring attention to the fact that they were declining. And in the 90s, when we started listing some of our ESA listed and Dangerous Species Act listed salmon and steelhead, um, there was also uh, a push to list uh, lamprey as well and start to call attention to that. So um, historically and currently lamprey are used for food by many of the tribes in the Northwest and also ceremony and medicine. And for some, they were served alongside salmon as a first food. So really, really important um, to many tribes in the Northwest. Um, we have actually three species here in the Northwest. Most of my talk is going to revolve around Pacific lamprey. Um, so when I'm talking about the culturally significant lamprey, it is the Pacifics. They're our largest species. Um, they are anadromous. So much like our Pacific salmon, they are hatched in fresh waters, um, kind of similar distribution to steelhead, and then they're going to go out to the ocean and return. Um, and so most of the time, if I'm saying lamprey, I kind of just generally mean Pacific lamprey, but we do have two other species um, that we know even less about. So we have our Western river lamprey, which is also anadromous, but more akin to coastal cutthroat. So they're going to go out and stay sort of near shore um, in the estuary system uh, and only feed for about a summer or a few months and then return to freshwater. And then we have our resident Western brook lamprey, um, which they are residents, so they stay in the freshwater system their entire life. So it's pretty cool. We actually have quite a bit of diversity in Washington, but um, as I said, most of my work and this talk will revolve around Pacific lamprey. Um, both Western river lamprey and Pacific lamprey are um, state species of concern um, and also federal species of concern. So we do have some um, 
None of them are listed, but actually uh, Western River lamprey is a candidate listed species for Washington state. Um, but we do, we, we know that their populations are declining and we do care to learn more about them and understand them, but they're not officially under any listing. So I'm gonna just go over the life, uh, the life history of, and this again, Pacific lamprey, um, just briefly, uh, so that people kind of understand kind of the diversity of their life and what they need. And then also um, kind of the slight differences between these anadromous fish versus our salmon and steelhead. Um, so much like uh, salmon and steelhead, they are, their eggs are burrowed, buried in a red. Um, so the lamprey are looking for gravels and cobbles to bury their eggs. Um, they spend about two to four weeks, depending on water temperatures before they hatch. And the larval lamprey will swim out of the red and they float downstream into uh, low velocity areas where there's fine substrate and they burrow into that area and they will um, basically feed in the substrate. So they'll stick their head out. If you can see that little lamprey in the picture on the lower right, um, stick their head out of their burrow and filter feed. Um, and they are gonna stay in those fine sediments and live in the stream bed for three to eight years. They're pretty difficult to age. So they um, might be there for a little longer, but roughly three to eight years. Um, and then they're gonna get environmental and physiological cues. And they're basically gonna start their smultification process, very similar. Um, they're gonna turn nice and silvery like our salmon and steelhead. Um, they also are going to make some pretty big transformations. They're gonna grow um, eyes and they're going to develop their oral disc that they're gonna use for feeding out in the ocean. So this process takes months and during this time they're not feeding. So they're just gonna be hanging out in the substrate, um, transforming into this juvenile stage. And then they're gonna head out to the ocean where they are um, ectoparasites for one to three years, possibly as long as six years out in the ocean. So they're gonna attach to the outside of their host um, and they're going to feed off their blood and body fluids um, for that time. And then they return to freshwater uh, they, unlike salmon, don't home to their natal stream. So they are just going to be coming into whatever stream they get. Um, one of the things they're smelling is pheromones that are released from the larval lamprey, but they're probably picking up on some other cues that we don't fully understand yet. Um, but they're going to kind of trigger in on those and swim upstream where they overwinter. Um, so they hunker down into rocks in between rocks or around large wood, and they're going to hang out in over the winter and they're gonna spawn in the spring, the following spring. And again, they're gonna build their reds in kind of gravel and cobble areas, um, very similar to steelhead. You'll actually oftentimes see them spawning in the same areas um, in the spring. So for our resident lamprey, they basically skip that juvenile phase and they um, transform straight from larvae into adults, um, staying in the freshwater the whole time. So one of the um, challenges when it comes to lamprey is that they are pretty tricky to identify. Um, it's one of those things that once you learn, it's no big deal. You can totally do it, but you have to kind of train your eye and you have to look at them pretty carefully and they're pretty wiggly. And so you can't, you know, you have to, yeah, you just have to pick them up and actually look at them. Um, and so when they're in their larval stage, we look at their tail coloration. And then at the juvenile stage, we look at the dentition. So actually the number of their teeth. Uh, and so this is a little bit prohibitive for um, understanding lamprey in the Northwest and across its range because it does take some training to identify and it takes time. And so a lot of times when we're um, sampling for lamprey at a smolt trap or when we're doing a restoration project, we oftentimes just say lamprey um, because we don't go into this specific species identification for very good reasons. But then we don't have an idea of actually what what species are living in our rivers and what their populations are because we're not going to species level um, identification. So that's a kind of challenge when it comes to our lamprey and something that um, we're hoping to kind of expand our understanding and just like spread knowledge on how to identify them so that we can get a little bit more information and not be in such a um, knowledge gap um, in the Puget Sound. So as far as where we find our lamprey, um, we have we can have all three lamprey across our river, um, but generally we have our Western Brook lamprey in the headwaters, um, kind of highest 
up in our watersheds. They can even be above um, some barriers to anadromy, um, current barriers to anadromy. Our Pacific lamprey are usually similar distribution to steelhead. So they're gonna be in our big medium-sized uh, rivers and creeks, sometimes in some smaller ones. Um, our Western river lamprey, uh, we think are lower in the watersheds and kind of in some of our bigger rivers. But quite honestly, we don't know hardly anything about Western River lamprey. Um, that we have found them in some smaller creeks. There is a possibility they're even kind of a species complex with our Western Brook lamprey, where they are kind of more akin to steelhead and rainbow, and their different life history strategies are very closely related. Um, but it's at, it, at this point we do think they're different species but the science is ever evolving. <laughs> so stay tuned. Um, they're a really cool fish we know nothing about. Um, and there is quite a lot of overlap, as I said. So you can be at a spot in a look in your watershed and have all three species present. Um, and we have a lot to learn. So this is one of those places where even just where they're located is a mystery. Um, and for the habitat that uh, we're looking for when we're thinking about Pacific lamprey and lamprey in general, they really need a quite a variety of habitat. So they need those really fine sediments um, for their larval stage. And this is kind of a part of the river that as salmon biologists, we don't think of as often, you know, maybe there are areas where there's high flow refugia in the winter, they're kind of off channel areas. Um, they do really need quite like flowing clean water, but we might not be thinking about those fine depositional areas as much when we're thinking about our salmonid species. Um, but that's really important for our larvae. As they grow and become larger, they tend to use what we call, and that's like type one is that fine sediment. Type two is kind of your smaller gravels, uh, maybe mostly gravel gravels and as they grow into larger larvae and into juveniles as they're transforming they might burrow into that larger substrate um, and then type three is our uh, gravels cobbles boulders um, more of the spawning substrate so they actually do use cobbles and gravels to build their red so it's a huge variety and so having diversity and um, really healthy rivers that sort sediment and um, are are very um complex is great habitat for our lamprey. So now I'm just going to go into some ecosystem connections and kind of the why we should care about lamprey part of the talk because um, it is sometimes, uh, you know, they're not a very, I think they're cute, but a lot of people don't think they're cute and um, they're a tricky fish to get to know um, because we don't see them very much. And so it is hard to feel an attachment to them sometimes because we don't see them, we don't fish for them. They're not something that we interact with in our everyday life. So um, this is the, the, uh, why we should care about lamprey part of the talk. So as um, there's been a uh, kind of term that we use for um, species that kind of impact their environment in an outsized way. We call them ecosystem engineers and beavers are one of those species that are oftentimes called that because they really change their environment with their actions. And um, lamprey have actually also been called that um, because of their kind of outsized impact on their environment. So as larvae, um, their burrowing actions into the sediment actually act oxygenates the bed material, um, decreases hardness and actually makes it ben more beneficial for other species to live in that substrate. Um, they also through their filter feed feeding um, are really good at nutrient cycling. So they're bringing nutrients from the water column into the substrate. So they really provide a lot of benefits to other um, species that live in the benthos, oftentimes macroinvertebrates that then are kind of that base of the food chain or among the base of the food chain for a lot of our other species like salmon and steelhead and trout. So they're actually really beneficial um, from that standpoint. Uh, from as larger fish, uh, we also talk about this for salmon and steelhead. They are, they're reds um, and that red building process, that bioturbation can be really beneficial. So it's stirring up materials on the bed, moving those fine substrates, moving materials downstream, really oxygenating that bed material as well. Um, and there's actually been a really, um, kind of interesting research done um, out of UC Berkeley that was looking at um, how red building for lamprey impacts um, juvenile salmonids and fry. And so for uh, there was increased forage during that time frame that they're building. And they actually have a pretty, depending on where you are, um, their spawning season goes pretty late. It can go as late as August in some places. And so it's a kind of later 
period of time than we see red building from our salmonid species from our steelhead. So it's kind of extending that period where you're getting that action in the river and increasing that drip forage. And then it was really cool. They were looking at, um, those low velocity areas that are created by the red are used by fry. And then they're also used um, by, I think it was the yellow legged frog um, that they would lay their egg masses in those areas too. So it was just kind of really neat. Um, it's during lower flow periods. So it's at a kind of different stage than we usually see our sp salmon spawning. Um, so it just like it's providing this benefit later into the summer um, for a lot of different species. So it's pretty cool um, and a, sort of similar to the way our salmon reds are beneficial. Uh, they're also an important component of our food chain. They're a very uh, weird part of the food chain because they are uh, prey and uh, they are, they have a lot of host fish. So they actually have a lot of fish that will prey on them. And then they will also be provided hosts for the lamprey. So it's this very complicated web. If you were to draw that one out, if you were uh, in third grade and had to do that. Um, but they deliver late season marine drive nutrients. So again, they're spawning later than our steelhead. And so they are going to bring that marine drive nutrients into our rivers, much um, kind of continuing that into the summer season. And historically, when they, we had those huge runs, we would have have tons of lamprey returning. So again, it's just this pulse of marine drive nutrients that we no longer have in many of our streams. Um, I work on the Willamette River in Oregon, and um, there's a lot of stories about the Willamette River stinking in the summer because there was all these lamprey returning just in mass. And so that thinking about that from an ecosystem perspective, there was just so much more marine drive nutrients that our streams historically had, um, in addition to our, land, our salmon steelhead. They're also extremely um, calorically dense and super fatty. So they are three to five times as calorically dense by weight than salmon or steelhead. So they are a very tasty treat. And I mentioned they're a little bit slower swimmers. So they're extremely delicious and slow swimming food for a lot of different creatures. Um, there's at least 46 known predators, but probably a ton more. And that encompasses a lot of avian predators. Tons of birds love eating them at their larval, juvenile and adult stage, um, river otters, seals, uh, sea lions, tons of things love to feed them. And they actually historically were probably a really great predation buffer for out migrating smolts because they are going out on that pulse in this with the spring flows. And again, slower and more calorically dense. So they would have been a really desirable prey item and would have taken some of that pressure off um, of our salmon as they were migrating out. So again, it's like these connections that we don't see anymore, but probably were really prevalent when both species were, or both multiple species, all species were in um, higher numbers in the past. And I wanted to bring up the sea lamprey because uh, this is very confusing for most people. So sea lamprey are an invasive species in the Great Lakes. And this is really a man-made issue. So sea lamprey historically live um, along the Atlantic coast, uh, both here in the United States, as well as over in Europe. Um, and they are anadromous species. Uh, they're, they're a large lamprey. You can see here on the picture, on the kind of upper right, the largest sucker mouth is the sea lamprey. Um, and when we connected the Great Lakes to the Atlantic, we invited a lot of different species into the Great Lakes, including sea lamprey. And they are not native to the Great Lakes. Those other four lamprey you see in that picture are the native lamprey to the Great Lakes. So the two smallest are brook lamprey species. So those are residents like our Western brook lamprey here. And then the two kind of medium size are parasitic lamprey that live in the Great Lakes, um, but they're significantly smaller. So the hard thing is we invited this very large predator in um, and uh, they're not native and none of the fish in the Great Lakes were adapted to including, including the, the fish from the Pacific Northwest, we added into the Great Lakes. None of them are adapted and involved with the sea lamprey. So um, they did some major damage to fisheries in the Great Lakes, um, but they are not native. 
all of our lamprey here on the West Coast are native and co-evolved with the species that we have here in the Northwest. So um, this is something that we like to just bring up because um, there's a lot of negative PR when it comes to lamprey and a lot of that is associated with sea lamprey. There's huge efforts to eradicate them in the Great Lakes, but here in the Northwest, our lamprey are native and co-evolved with the species we have here and actually very beneficial to our ecosystems rather than detrimental. So that's something that we try to, um, yeah, combat as a uh, biologist in the Northwest that are, that care about lamprey, um, which can be very difficult because there is a lot of negative association with sea lamprey for a good reason, because they are not native to the Great Lakes, but we as people added them there. <laughs> so um, it's kind of a, a tricky, um, tricky situation there that I'm glad we, we don't have to deal with here. So, um, we do have a lot of kind of similarities and overlap with our Pacific salmon and our Pacific lamprey, um, but we also have some differences. So it is kind of one of those things that um, when we're thinking about conservation and restoration, there's some overlapping components and then there's some differences. So I'm just going to kind of talk about some of those in the context of, of what we're doing in the Northwest when it comes to fish. So for our uh, lamprey in the Northwest, there actually was a petition to list four species under the Endangered Species Act in 2003. And in 2004, it was, um, there was a not warranted listing decision made for all four species. And this was Pacific lamprey, Western Brook lamprey, and Western River lamprey. So all three of our lamprey species in Washington, along with the Kern Brook lamprey, which is in California. Um, and for the two brook lamprey species and the Western River lamprey, basically insufficient information was provided to be able to make a listing re recommendation. Um, and so that was the reason those three were not listed. And then for the Pacific lamprey, they did find that populations were rapidly declining, but there was no listable um, entity. So the way ESA works is that you have to have that distinct population segment or evolutionary significant unit like we have with steelhead and salmon to be able to list that. So we can list the Puget Sound Chinook. Um, however, we can't list Pacific lamprey from California to Alaska. And because Pacific lamprey don't um, return to their home streams, they don't have that same genetic kind of basis for distinguishing the population the genetics are actually pretty broadly spread out. And since this listing, there has been some research that actually has picked up some markers that are more common in areas. For example, the Puget Sound and BC have some characteristics that are more closely akin in our region versus other places that Pacific lamprey are. But at the time, there was no dis listable entity. So instead, kind of in lieu of ESA listing, um, the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative was formed. Um, and this was just a basically a coordinated effort to try to protect and enhance Pacific lamprey um, across its range. And as part of that, um, we evaluated, this was uh, the first assessment was done in 2011, um, and it included evaluations of threats. So for the Puget Sound, it was basically um, decided that we didn't have enough information on lamprey specifically, so we were just going to use what affects salmon. So what affects our other anadromous fish in the area? Um, and so these will look really, sim really familiar to you all of just kind of the things that we think of that impact salmon and steelhead, um, flood uh, plain and stream degradation, passage barriers, dewatering and flow management and water quality are all things as um, you know people interested in fish we think about and want to make sure that they are improved in the future for our fish populations. Um, that last one, lack of awareness is not something that our Pacific salmon and steelhead have to combat with because we are all pretty aware of them and care a lot about them. Thank goodness. Um, I went to public schools in Washington and I learned about salmon in almost every grade. And it's probably one of the reasons why I'm a biologist. <laughs> um, and so it's really great that we learn about them, but we tend to not learn about lamprey. I don't think I ever heard about lamprey in an elementary school class. So um, it's one of those things that we're working on kind of linking them to salmon and just no, understanding that they're another anadromous fish that are out here in our waters. Um, as part of the assessment, Given that we just used salmon threats um, without actually looking into those um, for our lamprey impacts, it was also concluded that we needed um, targeted 
lamprey distribution surveys. So we actually understand where lamprey are in the landscape. And then also outreach to try and um, educate folks uh, from elementary school third graders all the way up to biologists so that we can get more information regarding Pacific lamprey um, and have more of a um, connection to those fish that we can gain that information that we're lacking and not having to just substitute um, salmon and steelhead criteria. So in this context, we're often asked, you know, is what's good for salmon good for lamprey? And as with most scientific things, it depends. And so there's certain things that definitely are beneficial to lamprey um, that are done in the name oftentimes of salmon steelhead, including barrier replacement. This is one of the best things that we can do for our anadromous fish. We all know that, you know, removing these perch culverts and putting in stream bed material that facilitates native fish of all species species going up and down, migrating um, both resident and anadromous fish is extremely beneficial. So this is these type of projects um, are, are slam dunks when it comes to lamprey, um, especially when we're putting stream simulation in and there's no actual um, infrastructure that they have to maneuver around because that can be really challenging. Also large wood projects, we generally say that those are really beneficial for lamprey. Um, they create sediment sorting, you get fine sediments, you get um, big areas where our um, adult lamprey can hold in the winter, kind of in the interstitial spaces of the wood. Uh, you get complexity and channel diversity and possibly multiple channels. It can be really great projects. So when it comes to salmon and lamprey, there's a lot of benefits that are derived uh, from this great work that we're doing for our salmonid species. Um, you know, recently this has gotten a lot of attention in the Nooksack. Um, any dam removal that occurs is great because dams can be extremely tricky for our lamprey to navigate. You know, uh, some of our dams, not all of them, but some of them have uh, historically had fish passage that's really targeted towards salmon. Um, you know, there's jumps involved, there's weirs, it's, you know, complicated to get through. And there's oftentimes really high velocities that lamprey can't, um, can't come that with. So um, dam removal is an awesome way to improve lamprey, you know, connectivity with their different environments. Um, we actually don't know if there's lamprey up on the middle fork at this uh, location, but hopefully we will know this in the future um, because we really don't know where lamprey are in the nooksack, which I'll get to, but um, but it's really exciting that, they're, um, that these projects are happening and it will definitely benefit our lamprey species. But where there's some divergence as far as benefit um, is just in the capacity uh, differences between lamprey and salmon. Um, as I mentioned, they can't jump. So anything that involves even a six inch uh, step is gonna be potentially a barrier for lamprey. Um, they can't maneuver corners, 90 degree corners are particularly challenging, especially if there's high velocities because um, they basically get blown off the corners. Um, and because they're not as strong swimmers, those high velocities are prohibitive as well. So um, a lot of our passage that we have provided historically for salmon and steelhead can be not possible for our lamprey species. And Pacific lamprey are actually fairly capable because they can climb using their mouth, but we actually don't know. Um, Western brook lamprey likely can't. Western river lamprey, we don't know, but definitely not as strong of climbers. Um, and because they're smaller, they're not as strong as swimmers. So even um, areas where we might get some specific lamprey, that would prohibit our other lamprey species that are smaller from getting in those areas. Um, and larvae are really small. Um, so you can have multiple age classes that are um, under 30 millimeters. They're, they're very small. Um, so when we put in um, screens, for example, to prevent entrainment of um, juvenile salmon. Um, that's great. We've kind of figured out that we can prevent a lot of that. But as far as lamprey go, you could be in training multiple age classes in those screens. They are just not lamprey. Um, the lamprey are going to go right through them. Um, so in some of these areas where we have made really big strides when it comes to protecting our um, salmon, we have not, we can't, we're not there yet for lamprey. And honestly, they're just so small. It's a very big challenge. It involves usually directing flow in different ways because they're going to get in there. Um, 
and lamprey are hidden. Again, it's just one of those things that is um, so cool about lamprey that they're burrowed in the sediment. But again, it, it really prevents us from connecting with them in a way because we don't see them on a regular basis. So this is an example of um, what we call dry electrofishing. So we've put the electrofishing probes just on the sediment. Um, and you'll notice there's no bony fish here. There's there's no fish on the dry land, um, but we do have lamprey at this location. So um, this is at a dewatering site. So they've drawn down the water um, and then they're just shocking right there on the wet sediment. And you can see the lamprey just boiling out of the sediment. Um, so yeah, they're hidden, but there. So it's definitely a challenge <laughs> when it comes to uh, trying to protect our lamprey. Um, so when we're thinking about restoration, we try to think about passage adjustments that would allow for lamprey to pass, um, especially when it comes to barriers that are not removed. Removal, best plan. Otherwise, there's some adjustments can be made. Um, there's a, a picture of an eel tile um, in that middle picture, and we're kind of working on testing some of that out. That, that's been developed to pass lamprey and eels um, in Europe, but we haven't employed them very much in the United States. So it's something that we're hopefully gonna try in the near future. Um, and for our in-water work, our restoration projects, we lamprey are likely present and they're likely multiple age classes, multiple species, um, and potentially multiple life stages. So it's just one of those things that we need to incorporate into our work um, at the front end to be able to benefit them most um, when we're doing oftentimes these salmon and steelhead enhancement projects. Um, again, the depositional areas that we don't really think of as um, beneficial in our streams are actually really beneficial for lamprey and for a lot of other creatures that um, are kind of the base of the food chain in those areas. Um, and then our survey methods, again, we they're hard to identify, lamprey are hard to identify. And when we're using electrofishing methods, which is a common way we look for fish, um, we actually are trapping lamprey in their burrows. Um, and so we use different settings when we're, we're trying to fine lamp, right? So it's just incorporating um, these different tactics and um, thinking about our rivers from the landscape of, from the lens of lamprey, um, in addition to our, our other anatomous fish. So as I mentioned, um, for that Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative, there was an assessment done. Um, and uh, this map is our current assessment for the lower 48 um, area where we have Pacific lamprey. And you'll notice that the Nooksack actually does have an assessment completed. Um, and I say completed because um, it's, it's done, but it could be better. We're working, we're going to work on it. Um, but right now it looks like lamprey are critically imperiled in the Nooksack. And then for the majority of the rest of the Puget Sound watersheds, we don't even have enough information to complete this assessment. We just literally have so many questions when it comes to lamprey that we can't even say whether or not the populations are, um, are at risk. Um, so as this for this assessment, the criteria that we looked at um, were the current uh, range that we find Pacific lamprey um, compared to historic. We also looked at population size, um, trends that we're seeing over three generations, which is roughly 27 years, um, and then that threat impact, which again, the threat impact, we just used salmon threats. We didn't even try to figure out what they were for Pacific lamprey because we didn't have enough information. So we really have a great need to um, quantify this information for the whole Puget Sound and um, get better information for the Nooksack as well, um, because we just have have so limited information and therefore limited knowledge on what our populations are and how we can impact them and, and um, support them. So it's it's actually very crazy that we just, the Puget Sound is a, just a mystery when it comes to lamprey. Um, so, and again, that reflects what we called out in the assessment that we need um, outreach, which thank you again for having me here. Uh, and then we also need those targeted lamprey distribution surveys, which I will get to and thank you again. So, um, here in the Skagit and Nooksack, this is our current understanding of where lamprey are. So blue is current and uh, brown is historic distribution. And uh, 
so right now it just shows that Pacific Lambert go to Mount Vernon on the Skagit, which is not true. Uh, we do have some more information that um, WDFW has from spawner surveys that we need to add to this. So there, it, there are definitely a lot more places than just the main stem Skagit. Um, and then on the Nooksack, it just shows the lower main stem and then a little bit of the South Fork. Um, it looks like, I think it's Squalicum and Whatcom Creeks are historic. And there is some information that I found that um, shows that there's lamprey in those watersheds. But again, we have this um, issue with identifying the species that a lot of times we either just assume it's Pacific lamprey without uh, actually confirming it is, um, or it's just labeled as lamprey. And so it's this kind of issue where we have some data, but we don't have enough data to um, really say whether or not Pacific is here specifically, because this is all Pacific lamprey here. So great need to get more information. And uh, this is a huge thank you to if anyone is on this call that collected eDNA for the um, Pacific lamprey uh, eDNA collection, which you all are doing in addition to all your bull trout work. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been a huge effort um, spearheaded by Kelly Kareem, um, who has is works for the Forest Service, and she has been. I I, I don't know how much you all have been involved on the bull trout end of things, but just doing a ton of eDNA sampling in the next act, which is super rad. Uh, and we are totally tag teamed off that for Lamprey. And we really appreciate all of your guys effort because, um, as I said, we just don't even know where they are. And so, um, the, the map on the right is showing the sites that were collected specifically in the lower watershed for Pacific Lamprey. And then, um, some of the sites that you all collected for bull trout are going to be run in the upper watershed so we can see if there's Pacific lamprey up there. Um, so huge thank you to anyone who collected eDNA. Um, we had about 20 people around the North Puget Sound collecting eDNA for this project this year. Um, and I honestly think that might be the, the, the largest coordinated effort on Pacific lamprey ever in the Puget Sound, so super cool. <laughs> um, and also huge thank you for um, adding Pacific lamprey to the 10 species assay that's being developed because I think that's going to go really far in um, one of just kind of the component of outreach of, of reminding folks that there's this other anadromous species that we are interested in that their populations do need to be studied because they are declining. Um, but then also just getting more information when it comes to distribution. So it's that um, current range, historic range, and then looking at that um, ratio is, is three components of our our analysis that we're going to be doing next year that we're that is totally benefiting from this eDNA work. So we're really grateful. Um, and we're hoping I was actually just on the still Guamish over the last couple of days collecting some samples there. Um, and then we had um, folks collecting all the way down to the Snohomish. So we're hoping that in early winter, we're going to have the results from this and we'll be able to really expand where we think Pacific lamprey are in these areas, um, which is just in time for our, for our assessment next year. So it's really Really cool. Um, and then I was looking on your website and saw that you all do steelhead surveys on Day and Finney Creek. Um, so this is just a topic for discussion um, after the talk. I would love to hear if you collect red data for Pacific lamprey and um, what time frames you're out there and if there's any um, desire to have uh, training. If you're not collecting lamprey data, I'd love to come up and go out with your surveyors and um, and collect some data because I Day and Finney Creek are both tributaries that we we have found Pacific lamprey. So, um, so you might all be experts in totally collecting reds all the time, or if you are interested, I'd love to come up. So this is just a topic for a later discussion, um, but really exciting because again, this is getting at our population size, especially with the creeks that we return to on an annual basis and we can start to get really good data where we can then start to assess our trends. So um, this, is, this is exactly the kind of information that we're trying to collect and coordinate and uh, collaborate across the sound because there's definitely folks out surveying um, and collecting data that we don't even know is even out there. So it's it's a matter of just um, like great talks like this where we can connect and, um, and collaborate. 
And this is a totally shameless plug for the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative. Um, hopefully these are some um, components of the initiative that you all might be interested in, or at least I can keep you updated if there's components that you, you want more information on. Um, as I mentioned multiple times, we've done this assessment to try and look at populations. There's also a conservation um, agreement, which we're re-signing next year. And this is a really cool um, opportunity for entities to basically commit to um, conservation of Pacific lamprey. So it's everything from um, tribes to federal, state, and local governments, um, nonprofits, city governments. Um, there's, a, there's, I think, about 30 or 40 signatories on the agreement. Um, and it just is basically um, saying that you are working towards conservation of Pacific lamprey. And it's a really um, awesome way to be involved. And then kind of in this, this initiative um, kind of tree of activities, there's also the regional management units, um, which I believe Bridget and Steve um, sat in on our um, inaugural uh, regional management unit meeting for the Puget Sound um, that we just had this year. So it's just brand new, um, but it's pretty cool. It um, kind of opens up some neat avenues. So we have a webinar series, which is just fun lamprey talks. So you may or may not be interested, but they're great. And they're starting up in December and they'll run through May, um, one Tuesday a month. And then we also have these um, subgroups that work on um, restoration, and uh, we also have a genetics and eDNA subgroup. So it's great ways to collaborate um, across, you know, we have a bunch of management entities or um, scientists or, uh, you know, interested parties that are working on salmon issues, but also uh, engaged in Pacific lamprey. So it's a great way to collaborate. Um, and then if you're part of the regional management unit, we actually do have some funding targeted towards uh, Pacific lamprey work. And one of the things that I thought might be interesting to this group is we are part of the National Fish Habitat Partnership or NIFHAP. And this allows us to access funds um, kind of in a, a different pot than, than just the broader restoration and conservation groups. And so one of them is this NOAA grant. Um, and it's really targeted towards um, cooperation with anglers. And so if there's projects that um, there's, it has to have a lamprey component, but that can be education, that can be research, that can be monitoring. And um, it's a really cool way to hopefully engage the angler population in um, happenings for Pacific lamprey is one of them. And then there's also a, a marine uh, NIFHAP partnership. And then um, the one in California that's on here is just California one, but um, there's some really cool potential, I think, to collaborate on um, restoration or monitoring projects. Um, and it's, yeah, so keep that in mind. And I actually think this one isn't due for, this is, this is later next year. Um, but if there's any components of restoration projects or um, outreach activities that you're interested in, it'd be awesome to collaborate. So I want to just throw this out here as that um, carrot for interactions with the Pacific Lamprey Conservation Initiative. Um, and that is uh, my presentation. So thank you so much for inviting me here today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all and um, just talk about how awesome Lamprey are. Um, and I think one of the most exciting things that I feel you know, is just fun about Lamprey is that we're still really learning a lot. Um, and so getting, you know, just, we, we need everyone, every observation is actually really great data. <laughs> and so um, engaging with everyone in the Puget Sound is, is super fun for me because we just, we don't have any information and we're learning so much every day. So um, it's just a, a fun fish to work on because we have a lot of mysteries yet to solve. So um, thank you so much. And if you have any questions, I would love to take them. And yeah. Monica, thank you so much. Um, we have had a lot of really good uh, installments of the speaker series. And I have to say that this was by far my favorite one. And I think it's because <laughs> I think it's because 80%, 85% of that information was brand new to me. So that was really cool. One of my best friends uh, did a presentation, so she might not be happy to hear that, but um, you definitely <laughs> take the cake for me. Um, that was, that was really cool. Um, Thank you. 
it is really cool because we can, I, I, I worked with Sam and Steelhead for years and years and years. And, um, and then you like learn about this other fish and it's like, you, you're just a brand new biologist, you know, you're just like, Oh, I didn't know any of this. And it's just really exciting. Yeah. It's like the excitement of being a kid playing in the Creek, you know, yep. you get to experience things for the first time again. Um, there was a lot to unpack in that last bit. And I think there might be, there's, I'm, I'm not seeing, oh, I see Scott on here. Scott, I'm going to throw you under the bus uh, a little bit later to talk about spawner surveys. Cause that was a topic of discussion, but, awesome. um, uh, I'd love to just open the floor and shut up and see if anyone else has questions, uh, directly related to Monica's presentation. I've got a, got a question you go. for you, Monica. There you go. <laughs> Thanks a lot for presenting that. That was some incredibly interesting stuff. Um, one of my questions was, what, what is that feature um, sort of in your background? Yeah, you got a picture of the lamprey. It looks like there's a some feature in between the eyes of the lamprey. What, what is the, like, that? Light spot? Yeah, is that actually, is yeah. that a, a feature? Or is that a grain of sand or something? No, that's actually a feature. So it's it's basically, it's a third eye. So it's a light sensing organ in their, um, in their, you know, more or less forehead. And so when they're in their larval stage, they actually don't have eyes besides that light sensing organ there in their forehead. And then they actually have a light sensing um, organ in their tail as well. So that when they burrow down, they make sure to tuck their tail in the sediment too. Um, and so in that larval stage, that's their, their only way of um, sensing light and dark um, are those just kind of light spots on their on their forehead and then in their tail. All right, interesting. Yeah, yeah, they're totally wacko. <laughs> I've got more for you too. If nobody else is going to jump in there, um, so they they don't pick their natal waters. They're anadromous, but don't return to their natal waters. How do how do they? Uh, get distributed across watersheds? So we think that they return to streams potentially based on where their hosts swim. So they are hosts on a number of different fish. I think it's over 36 at this point. Um, they are hosts on whales as well. And so when they're out in the ocean, they attach to a number of hosts, we see that there's marks that are smaller and then there's marks that are larger. So we think that they have multiple hosts. Um, as they grow bigger, they might change hosts. Um, but we actually don't know a lot about what they do in the ocean. Um, you know, it's hard to study fish in the ocean. So a lot of our information is um, from bycatch and we have some tags um, that are in lamprey. Uh, there was actually a, a fish that was tagged off the coast of Russia, I believe in the Bering Sea, and it pinged on the Bonneville Dam in the Columbia Basin. So hugely distributed across the Puget, uh, the Pacific Ocean. Um, and they're also um, over in uh, Japan and Russia. So they have this huge distribution. So we think to some degree, it might be that, you know, whatever host they're on when they get to a certain size and they're getting those physical cues and potentially some environmental cues, that they drop off and, and then they're near a river that they go up. Um, we know that they cue in on pheromones that are released by the larvae. Um, so there's a smell in the river that basically says, hey, this is really good habitat for larval rearing. So you might want to spawn here. Um, but there's likely other cues that they're picking up on. Um, you know, like a lot of fish, they have really strong smell receptors. Um, that's like one of their main senses. And so um, there's likely other things that they're cueing in on. Um, but it's kind of, we, we don't know a lot. Um, there's some new genetic research that's being done. Um, that's trying to kind of figure out a little bit more of like, you know, are they more likely to go in one river and, uh, you know, if they're, re they're, um, rearing in the Columbia, are they more likely to come back to a different watershed in the Columbia or are they coming back, you know, more, you know, widely dispersed. And, and so we're trying to understand that, but we don't still have a very good idea, but it's probably a combination of smells and cues from the freshwater, um, getting to certain sizes or whatever physical cues in the 
salt water, um, and then potentially wherever they they get those cues, they drop off from their host. So, um, so yeah, it's it's complicated probably, and we don't know <laughs> is the bottom line. <laughs> but but possibly difficult to reestablish in an area where the, where you might not be getting any pheromones. Well, so coming we, out of. So there have been a few. So we think that pheromones from any larval lamprey could could be a signal. So you could have Western Brook lamprey in a headwater stream and still have them, even though anadromy has been blocked and those could be releasing pheromones um, because we've seen like with the Elwha dam removal and um, the dam removal on the white salmon, Pacific lamprey have readily um, re-entered uh, those systems and are spawning and um, within very short order. So nice. they do have, I think like a lot of wild species, there's the few that are just gonna wander, right? They're gonna, they're gonna search out new territory and they might not be following some of the, the more traditional cues that the other fish are picking up on. There's been a couple um, uh, places in California that they were extirpated, but they've seen them return and whether or not there were, um, I'm not sure if there were brook lamprey in those watersheds. So we do think that they they are picking up on those pheromones, but there's other signals that are also driving them um, because they are returning to areas that are open to them um, pretty quickly. So we just have, you know, a few dam removal uh, projects that, you know, are big and we've studied and we're finding that, but it does seem like they're queuing in on other things potentially that are pulling them into those watersheds sheds. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. Any I'll, other questions? I'll, I'll, I'll chime in since uh, Bridget put me on the spot already. <laughs> I'm also going to pick on <laughs> Berkeley. So get ready, Berkeley. <laughs> um, all right. Thanks. Thanks for spreading it around. So first, first off, thank you, Monica. This was uh, incredibly informative. Um, I would echo everything Bridget had to say. Um, you certainly increased my lamprey knowledge about 98%. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's really interesting too, to, to know about the spring spawning and the overlap with steelhead, because for, for several years through TU, we did, uh, uh, independent uh, steelhead spawner surveys on finny and day creeks, uh, tributaries to the middle of Skagit. And we would often kind of stumble across these uh, obvious areas of activity where it, it appeared something had be, been digging. We, we often just kind of dismissed them as, as test red. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in retrospect, it's quite possible you know, some, some of that could have been lamprey activity. Um, a lot of times we'd, we'd see these tail outs that were just like completely torn up. Um, like there'd just been a mass frenzy of spawning activity, but it was, off, it was often very shallow reds, like a, a lot less than I, I would expect to see out of, uh, you know, an adult steelhead. Um, so yeah, it, 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 what to what extent uh, are surveys being done on on lamprey spawning activity in our local streams? So it seems so. I just I started with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, just about a year ago. So I started in the middle of the pandemic, um, and I am working on gathering what data we have as far as um, spawner information. And from what I can tell, so you know. At the way WDFW operates is it's regional. So there's the Puget Sound. Um, I actually technically am based in the lower Columbia um, region. Uh, and so for each region, um, it seems a little bit dependent on who is there. Um, on region six, which is our Washington coast, we have a few biologists that have done a lot of lamprey surveys um, and have kind of, you know, been interested, I would say, in lamprey. And so they have been doing quite a lot of surveys and they have um, trained their staff to do it. But I, I think that is pretty variable from what I've kind of picked up. But in the Skagit, there has been um, some level of ramp lamprey red data collected. And again, I kind of think it depends on who is 
who's been trained, who's working, um, what the capacity is, because some years you just have the ability to take more information than others. Um, and most of the time it is uh just counting the reds and it's not necessarily like flagging them like we do for steelhead, um, no measurements. Um, and so it, and it can be kind of, uh, a little piecemeal. So that's something that I am hoping I'm working with some colleagues, uh, and we're hopefully going to get, um, a protocol that we can send out to folks that is uniform because even on the east side, I work with um, my U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service colleagues and they're collecting red information, but they're not necessarily working with a state agency because that's not, you know, they're, you know, they're just in different streams. And so we don't even have a unified protocol. Um, and so it's, it's definitely patchy. We do have some, like I said, for the Skagit. And I believe that um, both Day and Finney, I looked up, there's been at least some level of lamprey um, documentation in those rivers. Um, and from our perspective, as far as lamprey biologists, um, even just counting the reds is extremely beneficial because we don't have that level of data. And, um, and we've talked about, so that um, tail, tail out that you're talking about, sometimes we do get these kind of um, conglomerations of reds and typically they're, they're pretty round and they're about one to two feet. Um, and the way that the lamprey move the sediment is they actually attach the rock with their sucker mouth and then they swim the rock out of the way. So it's kind of incredible. They can actually move like a, a pretty decent sized cobble, but you'll end up getting these kind of saucer shaped. And this is generally, sometimes you can get this just like patchwork and it ends up being a lot bigger, but you kind of get this round, um, shape that has bigger rocks on the outside and then some fine material on the inside where they actually, um, they actually mate and lay their eggs in there. Um, and so it doesn't have that big tail out, but they oftentimes spawn in the tail outs because it's already like moved for them and kind of clean and, you know, they can already like move the material. Um, so they totally overlap with steelhead. Um, and they actually tend to spawn a little bit later in the season. So that's another part of the spawner surveys. We don't, we don't, you know, we end our spawner surveys for, for steelhead usually in May when we see less of them, but we can have, especially in colder systems, we can have our lamprey spawning as late as August. Like on the east side, it's, it's oftentimes in August. Um, and so, and in the Puget Sound, we have a lot of, you know, glacially fed cold creeks and we don't know, maybe they're spawning into June and July and we're not actually capturing that in our data because we're only looking when we're looking for steelhead. Um, so, it is, it is um, data that we'd love to get. And if you're interested and you have uh, a training or something that you're doing with volunteers, I would love to come up and we could walk the creek. And unfortunately, when we're, you're oftentimes doing your training for steelhead spawner surveys, there's not lamprey yet, or there's very few of them. Um, so I can also come up like mid season um, and we can start looking for them. But um, but it would be great if you all were interested in, in um, you know, even just like, if you have a question, you're like, well, is this one, you can take a picture, um, and send it to me. And, um, it's really helpful to just, we're trying to get, um, any of that data that's pretty easy to collect while we're collecting information on salmon, um, and having it be consistent. Cause that's the problem that we run into when we're trying to think about trends is we might have spawner survey collected for three years when this person was collecting it because they were into lamprey and they were, they had the time and they had the capacity and there was staffing available. And so they collected red data and then it didn't happen. And so, you know, it's like it, because it's not consistent, we have a really hard time identifying how our populations are doing over time because we just don't have that consistency. So if there's interest, I would love to um, come up and, and do some spawner surveys and see if we can find any reds. And um, it does sound like potentially, a lot of people think they're test eggs because they're small and um, they're, yeah, obviously cleaned, but they don't really look like a steelhead red. And um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a funky, mm, funky little red. You, you mentioned the, the, just the, more spherical shape and and the process of creating the red because I, I see a lot of them that are very it's like how 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 could anything make it this round because salmon and steelhead reds are typically a lot more elongated you know it, yeah. and it's dug out and there's there's a clear pit and there's a tailing and everything and these are like it's it's like a crop circle sort of yeah totally totally um 
round shape and they are quite a bit smaller. And uh, yeah, we, we tend to, particularly on Finney Creek, we tend to see a lot of late spawning activity, like end of April, uh, early May. Some years it's the first two weeks of May that it really takes off. Um, and so that may be why we're also potentially seeing some lamprey reds out there yeah, too. Yeah, definitely. That would be that would be about the right time. So yeah, interesting. Yeah, it's really cool because they they move the rocks with their sucker mouth, um, and then in order to spawn, the female actually attaches to a cobble. So they really need some larger substrate, even though. Um, you know, they're a relatively small bodied fish. Like they're usually only a pound or so as adults. Um, but they do spawn in those like bigger substrates. Um, and so it is kind of, um, and they tend to spawn at night and they tend to kind of hunker down at day. So even when you're doing a survey, you might not see them even though they're there. So yeah, they're, they're tricky, tricky little fish. <laughs> I had a cool. question about um, age and because that was one of the most surprising things for me when I started learning a bit more about lamprey is how long they spend in that, you know, in sediment in the juvenile stage. Um, so I had a question about that, but Berkeley has a good story about finding lamprey and both of us kind of discovering like just how old that lamprey probably was when he found it. So um, Berkeley, can I pick on you to tell your story about finding lamprey and then where you found, was it in Whatcom Creek? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, well, uh, thanks Monica for joining us tonight. Uh, super awesome presentation. Um, well, like Bridget said, um, I was kind of cruising through Whatcom Creek here in town, uh, walking, waiting, and uh, I looked down and saw what I assumed was a was a red, um, it was just a cleared piece of cobble in slow moving water. Um, and after staring at it for a minute, you know, what I saw, I was like, oh, these have to be lamprey. Um, I'd never seen anything like it. Um, and just kind of watching them for a minute, um, you know, it was, I, it was kind of hard to get an exact size on them, but they looked about four or five inches long before I tried to, you know, hover over them a little more and as soon as I kind of put a shadow on them they, they took off on me um but you know seeing them at four and five inches in our little you know seasonal creek like that how old would you expect you know a lamprey of that size to be so those probably were western brook lamprey um based on the size and mm -hmm. um and they're they're really cool I've seen some um spawning of those as well. And it just like the, the, one of the sites was like 16 of them, just like all together and moving around and they move substrate as well. So even though their mouth, they don't use to be a parasite cause they just are filter feeders and then, and then transform into adults where they don't feed, they still move little bits of substrate with their mouth. And so they're, they're super fun to watch. Um, but we honestly, you know, we just don't have information on Western Brook lamprey. Um, we, tend to think that they rear for several years in the substrate and then they transform directly into adults. So they'll um, transform and then spawn that following um, spring. So they, they don't have as long, they don't have the juvenile stage and they don't have uh, a prolonged adult stage. So they're likely shorter lived than our Pacific lamprey and probably our Western river lamprey, which our Pacific lamprey can be, you know, we think around 12 is an old Pacific lamprey, but they're really hard to age because they don't have, you know, for uh, a lot of our fish species, we have otoliths and they, the, the second they're born, they start to add layers to that otolith so we can cut it open and look at it like a tree ring. Um, but lamprey, because they, they're so old, they actually, we call it a statolith. So it's like an older, oldolith. And it, um, it dematerializes at different times in their life stage. So it's not static. So we, we can't age them as well. Um, because there's no bony feature, there's no hard feature. Um, so likely the Western book lamprey are rearing, you know, maybe up to 10 years. It probably depends on, um, you know, food resources, temperature, um, many different things. Um, and I, I have to say, I, I don't even know. Um, and we know so little about them that I'm guessing um, we, 
we do know that, you know, lamprey are really plastic and they are survivors. They've been here for four mass extinction events. So I'm also guessing that those lamprey can be anywhere from a few years to older and they just transform when they get to a certain physical and environmental cues. Um, oftentimes the larvae for the brook species get bigger. Um, and so they'll be bigger than our anagema species when they transform into adults. Cause again, they don't have that intermittent feeding stage when they're juveniles. Um, so they might actually spend longer as a larvae to get to that stage. Um, but the, the short answer is, I don't know because we don't research them at all, but they're likely, you know, five to 10 years old, um, depending okay. on the system. That's my best guess. <laughs> well, awesome. Thank you for that. Yeah. That was in Whatcom Creek, you said? Yeah, that was in Whatcom Creek. That's awesome. It is cool because they, um, when you see them, uh, they are like, they, they, they will move away from the red, like if you're really close, but they also are not as skittish as uh, salmon or steelhead or drought. And so you can actually get like relatively close to them and, and watch them. And they're, they're pretty, um, pretty mellow as far as fish go. So um, it's really fun to, to like sneak up on them and then watch them. And um, yeah, so that's super cool. Yeah, it was really cool. I it really took me hovering right over them for them to skitter off. For sure. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. That's awesome. And I don't know if you were watching the chat, Monica, but Brandon was also saying that he's seen them. Uh, I'm assuming Brandon's talking about Donovan Park off of Friday Creek Road, um, and he was awesome. seeing kind of the sim similar thing. Um, were they similar size? Were they that kind of like six inch sort of range? Yeah, it's exactly what Burke was just describing. Um, uh, yeah, it's that, I think it's, yeah, it's off Friday Creek Road. It's it's not the one that's on all, the park that's on Old 99, but if you drive up Old 99, you turn left on Friday Creek Road, there's a county park there. Oh, cool. And you park at the park and then you just walk up the stream till you can, there's a log across it and you can sit there on this log and just watch these lamprey and like you know this is it's you know memorial day ish time and you can just watch these probably four to six inch lamprey like moving little pebbles and making these little circles and like you know you're just right next to them and they don't really seem to care and it's super cool to watch so that's awesome i'll have to um do ski to see so I can go up there during that time and then um and then go watch the lamprey. <laughs> we should just plan a lamprey field trip where you can come up and we can just walk around a bunch of creeks up here and try that would be great. Lamprey. I'm totally in. <laughs> that sounds more fun than sitting in front of a computer screen too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and it would also, honestly, especially once we get our eDNA distribution, um, it would be really cool. I have my backpack electro fisher and we can come up mm -hmm. and um, look in some of the creeks, especially, you know, upstream if we get a hit for Pacific lamprey, um, go upstream and then, um, and then shock and see if we can um, see and how far up that distribution goes. Um, when I was out at the Stillaguamish, it was the, on the um, North Fork yesterday, I um, shocked at the highest site that we got that I was um, sampling just to see if I could um, find some lamprey just so we can you know, kind of test that site. And I found um, our Western Brook lamprey um, or Western River lamprey at the larval stage, they're indistinguishable. So we just call them Lampetra, which is the genus. And then there was also um, Pacific lamprey, larval lamprey up there. So, um, so it's really, so I'm really hopeful that that eDNA sample comes back as a positive for um, Pacific lamprey, because I know they're there. So, <laughs> so cool. it'll be a good um, troubleshoot. Yeah, so it'll be really fun once we get that distribution map to, to actually go out and kind of um, survey some other spots. So we can definitely do that. Cool. Okay, yeah. we'll put that on the list. And yeah. then um, another note, you had mentioned the uh, upcoming webinar series starting in December. If you can keep yep. me posted on that, we can definitely yep. share that so folks can watch I will it. send, I don't know that the links are out for that quite yet, but um, okay. it's, we will, I will definitely share that when they're up. And it's, um, it's basically a two hour um, block. They're all recorded. So you can also go back and like, if you want to see certain talks or um, you can kind of go through but it's, um, it's, uh, every Tuesday, I think it's gonna be the 
second Tuesday of the month, but I'll, I'll send all that information out. And there's some really cool talks. And I think the one in December, actually, um, one of the speakers is going to be this um, paleoecologist who is researching ancient lamprey. And it's it, yeah, just from what I heard, it's going to be so interesting because they are so old. Um, and so they, and they really haven't changed much. Like the fossil lamprey look pretty much like our lamprey today. Like they're just, they're just, they are very efficient at surviving and they just haven't changed that much. Um, but there is uh, kind of new evidence that the freshwater component of their life history is an, is a more recent evolutionary trait. So they historically were all saltwater and then they have this now um, kind of added component of their life cycle where they're in freshwater. Um, I mean, at the time that lamprey evolved, there was basically just moss on land. So, you know, it just like, it just, they, they've seen so much change um, and, but weirdly haven't changed change that much. So this, this, uh, paleoecologist is going to talk about the research that he's done on ancient lamprey. So I'm totally stoked. I think it'll be really neat, but, um, but I think that'll be that first, um, December one. So I'll, I'll make sure to send, uh, that information to you, Bridget, so you can share it. Cool. That is awesome. Yeah. It's super nerdy. It's like max nerd them. So yeah, it's going to be good. <laughs> well, you're barking up the right tree, um, there. <laughs> so that's good. Um, any other questions for Monica? I'll also yeah. open up. Oh yeah, I had, go I ahead. Oh, sure. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, yeah, great, great presentation, Monica. Um, you talked about that kind of middle eye that they have. Are there any other species that have anything similar to, to that? That seems pretty unique. You know, so the cl most closely related fish are the hagfish and they don't even have visible eyes. Um, so they, I would, I don't know anything about hagfish fish besides that they're closely related to lamprey and that they're really cool and they slime a lot and they're like a totally fascinating group of fish that is yeah just really cool but I don't know any details about them but I would guess that they probably have some light sensing organ that is not a developed eye um and I think that you know I would guess there would might be other fish that have that just because there's like crazy deep sea fish that have you know, adapted to other, you know, environments. Um, but the, but I think that third eye, just the fact that they don't, they, you know, they grow eyes in the middle of their life, which is kind of crazy. Um, it's actually really energy intensive. So as larvae, they actually shrink in length because they're using so many resources to develop their teeth and mouth and then grow their eyes. Um, but yeah, the light sensing organ is all they have for the first many years of their life. Um, and I would guess that there'd be other fish, but I'm not totally sure. But it is a really cool adaptation. And it's really cool that there's one in their tail because if you if you ever get to watch them burrow, um, it's really cool. They'll like kind of poke around, find a soft spot and they'll start burrowing in. And then their tail will kind of like lay on the surface and then get sucked in. And, um, and you know, it's really cool because if it stayed out there, if they thought they were all the way in, it'd just be like ripe for predators, but they know to pull it all the way in so that they don't get attacked by predators. So um, it's really, really neat. Um, neat uh organs that are unlike other other fish awesome thanks yeah hey well monica thank you so much um for the presentation it's been just sort of fascinating i was at sort of a the unique experience of being uh raised by two whale biologists and and oh, so wow. you sort of blown my mind because i'm realizing i've been I'd be like, I've seen these hanging off the back of whales. Yeah, that's <laughs> so kid. cool. Yeah, there's some really neat pictures. And it's like, oh my gosh, that's a lamprey. <laughs> yeah. So the, anyway, that sort of um that's that's, awesome. it sort of blows my mind. Do you mind. know what species? I, what did your parents study a specific species or is it so my parents specialize in baleen whales, cool. but I feel like I've seen them on sperm whales a bunch in particular. Yeah, I think that is one of the ones that's more common. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, and yeah. now you, you could They've see they've been the on little, orcas too. Really? Okay. Well, there's your there's your marketing campaign. I know. The lampreys. Something something about orcas. That's how we're selling salmon <laughs> these days. No, we're just helping the Chinook by predation buffer. <laughs> that's that's the that's the ticket there. Yeah. So anyway, super super cool, super interesting. Um, you gave a little shout out to like the Olympic Peninsula, I, and that made me wonder: I mean, is there any place? Um, any region in Washington or, or really anywhere on the West Coast that you think is doing like a better job of integrating um, lamprey recovery into habitat restoration work or just doing better um, on lamprey issues in general? Um, 
So there are a lot of places that I've made huge, huge strides in um, incorporating lamprey. And I would say that um, my familiarity is most with the Columbia Basin um, and the Columbia Basin tribes are have been uh, some of the most vocal as far as um, raising the alarm on de declining populations, um, really, really instrumental in the research. Um, and the they've uh, a couple of tribes, um, the Yakama Nation, the Confederate tribes, the Umatilla, um, both have now artificial propagation for lamprey. They've done translocation. I mean, they have been instrumental in all aspects of lamprey conservation. And that has really um, expanded to the to the region. So there's um, the Army Corps of Engineers and Bonneville Power Administration now um, have funds dedicated towards lamprey improvements on main stem dams. Um, the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board uh, now looks at lamprey as it was you're doing a restoration project. They want to see components of lamprey in the restoration. They've just started that, but they there there's really a um, much more concerted and regional push for lamprey conservation in the Columbia Basin, I would say. Um, and again, I think that really stems from the, the tribal connection. Um, for many of those tribes, it was a first food. Uh, and I think that there was lamprey harvest for a number of the Puget Sound tribes, but I just don't think it was quite um, the level of significance. It, and I think in part, just because there's a lot of really tasty things in the Puget Sound and on the coast, you know, you just had more food resources. Um, and we've actually, um, there's uh, been a lot of um, participation by tribes um, in lamprey uh, sharing of data, but it definitely doesn't seem to be um, as much as of a driver. Um, the, the Columbia River tribes and then a number of tribes on the um, coast of California and Oregon um, have really uh, just made it more of a priority. And whether or not that's historic or that's current, you know, that's just what it's been. Um, so my experience in the Columbia Basin is definitely that there's been a little bit more of a concerted effort. Um, and that's one of the reasons uh, why the Puget Sound and the Washington Coast are these kind of um, unknowns because we just haven't had as much um, motivation, I think. Um, and so with the regional management units as part of that umbrella of the conservation initiative, um, I think that the first meeting for those regional management units, I want to say was like in 2010, maybe, um, and they've slowly kind of come online. Um, and we have had regional assessments for the Puget Sound and the Oregon coast, but the first time we actually like met as a group was literally this May. Um, and so we're just starting that like collaborate collaboration in these regions. Um, and I don't think that necessarily signals that they're, they're less important um, to the tribes, but just maybe not like as singularly important as um, they were for the Columbia river tribes. And so, um, and it's really interesting because there's also, you know, in British Columbia, there's a number of tribes that harvest in them there. Um, but we, so far, British Columbia hasn't been part of the conservation uh, initiative because it's just been in the United States, but we're hoping to expand it there. Um, but British Columbia and the Puget Sound, um, we kind of think we have some overlapping um, genetics and the Washington coast, we just have like kind of no idea, but we, we see some different um, life history strategies, potentially. We just, we have like all these kind of unique attributes that we need to research, but we just haven't yet. Um, and so I think when we get there, um, where the Columbia Basin is and some of the California areas, um, we're, I think we're gonna learn a lot just generally about Pacific Lambray. Um, but yeah, it is kind of interesting. I, I think it's just total, the tribes have led the way and then the agencies have have followed because we were like, oh, yeah, that is important. <laughs> um, so it's really, really cool. Um, the amount of dedication and research and it's just it's really, really awesome. Um, and so it, for the conservation initiative, we have um, a tribal lead and then an, an agency lead that's either state or federal. And so it's a co-led initiative, which I also think is really powerful. Um, so, yeah, it's 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 uh, kind of just varies region to region, but California has also done a lot of really cool stuff. And some of the tribes in um, the Oregon coast, especially in Southern Oregon um, have really led the way. So, um, but the Columbia Basin is where most of my experience is. And it's um, definitely uh, a lot more information for that area than we have in the Puget Sound. That was long-winded, sorry. <laughs>
Excellent answer. I really appreciate it. Any other questions for Monica? Sweet. We've had some really good questions so far. Yeah. Um, really appreciate it. I actually love talking to um, smaller groups because you just actually get to talk to people. <laughs> it's yeah. really nice. Yeah. No, definitely. Um, so again, we're recording. I will, uh, I'm going to put the link to our YouTube channel in the chat and you can rewatch, you can share, um, you can type North Sound to you into YouTube and you'll get to the same place. Um, so don't worry if you lose the link. Um, but I'm pretty serious. I think a lamprey field trip would be pretty fun in the spring. So we should definitely stay in touch on that. I would love that. I would totally love that. Ooh. And and if it coincides with spawner surveys, that's great. Also, I love excuses to come to Bellingham. There's like nothing more than I, I that I like to do or go on this gadget. They're like two of my favorite rivers. So um, so I would love to come up and we could do as the water kind of drops when it's a little bit better for larval surveys, we could do kind of a June um, time frame as well. So you can book me for multiple days and I would happily come up and survey up there. So um, just keep me keep me in mind and I'll definitely send out the information um, for the webinar. And then also I'll just, um, um, well, Bridget, you have my slides. So you can feel free to mm -hmm. share those. And then that um, that NOAA grant, if, if you guys just, you know, are coming up with ideas on projects or you're partnering with like the city or anyone else um, on projects, um, keep that in mind. It's, it is not a huge pot and it definitely has to be targeted towards Lamprey, but if there's any way to add that into projects, if you're interested, um, we'd love to talk to you about that. And my um, colleague, uh, Alicia is kind of our, our grant coordinator and she has a lot more information if you are interested and if a project would fit under that umbrella. Awesome. Yeah, we, um, I had someone from NOAA reach out to our email address, um, inviting us to, um, uh, like some sort of opening ceremony or something about that, you know, NOAA trying to partner with recreational angling community. Awesome. So, um, hopefully that's something we can talk about in that space. So great. Cool. Well, um, we're at eight 30 and I will, uh, I'm going to stop the recording. Um, I will